Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and uh, welcome to the Mediation Africa Forum a virtual series hosted by Wassili Anahap uh, today, the 15th day of October 2020. I am your session moderator, uh, mediator Sarah Atera. Our event today is the quarter three, October 2020 Mediation Day Symposium, where we host three sessions. We have had the seven o'clock session. We have also had the two o'clock session and we are now in the 4 p.m. session. We begin with the national anthem recited in English. O oh God of all creation, bless this, our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, particular session is re being recorded and will be made available on Wasiliana Hub platforms. In converging the community of professional mediators in Kenya and Africa, Wasiliana Hub hosts events that are in person or virtual, and uh, they include weekly sessions, monthly meetups, a quarterly med mediation day symposia, as well as the annual strategy conference in its second year, and the African International Mediation Week, which kicks off in December 2020. All the events and discussions are aligned to the Strategy 2020 theme, ADR Tomorrow for Africa, which is focused on positioning, policy and practice of mediation and dispute resolution. ADR uh, Tomorrow for Africa is to reimagine, rewire and retool in positioning, policy and practice so as to transform the dispute ecosystem. By ADR, we mean appropriate, alternate, as well as alternative. The focus of our quarter three uh, mediation uh, symposium, this Thursday, the 15th day of October 2020, is the economics of dispute in Kenya. We are now in the sunset, session we are we're looking at the topic able differently uh, our speaker this afternoon is uh miss motegi miss nina uh motegi uh, holds an msc in advanced nursing and psychology as well as health from the City University in London. Uh, this, uh, taking us through this uh, particular talk, uh, we'll be looking at uh, what them understand uh, the different disabilities, as well as special needs that people live with. Uh, we will also be able to understand and have heightened awareness uh, to be able to design mediation practices to be inclusive. We will also be able to be prepared to manage mediation sessions and serve people with different needs. Ms. Mutegi, uh, apart from uh, holding the MSc in, in nursing, is also the director and CEO of the Mirema School she is a Bible entrepreneur as well. Good evening, Miss Mutegi. Good evening, Sarah. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And how yes. are you too? I am very fine. It's always very interesting to you listen to yourself being introduced. Um, you, you, it makes you ask a few questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Mm. We are looking forward to your session this evening. Uh, Please uh, feel free to go on. All right, thank you very much. Um, allow me to project my screen, which means uh, yours will come down.
Okay, tell me when you can see that, Sarah. We can see it. Okay, brilliant. I'll just maximize it. Okay, so thank you very much. Let me just make a note of the time so that um, I stick to my allocated time. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nina Motegi, and um, I am the Chief Executive Officer of Mirama School. Mirama School is a multi-curricular school that is based on off Thika Road um, behind USIU, um, and it is a school that has been in existence for the last 20 plus years. So I'll be taking you through a talk um, um, about special needs and maybe some of the things that you could consider um, in your role as mediators um, as you carry on your practice. So maybe a little bit about me to begin with. Um, my qualification, so I started off in the healthcare profession and now I am more in the business profession. So I started off with a career in nursing. Um, and during that time, I had the opportunity to lead several um, high dependency units, mostly in the UK, which is where I qualified and trained. And in the course of my nurse uh, journey as a nurse, I went into a space um, on adherence to medication. So one of the challenges that um, healthcare professionals face is that many patients don't adhere to their treatments, mostly because their conditions are invisible. So I went into a space where I used to work in um, health programs, uh, making sure that we had ways to make sure that patients were taking their medications as prescribed. So that pushed me into the health psychology space and I did a master's in that as well. And I had the opportunity to set up various healthcare programs in um, the UK, in Spain, in Germany and in Dubai mostly. Now that was all done away from Kenya. I actually left Kenya at the age of 17, but I recently came back five years ago. And since I've been back, I've had the opportunity to get involved with a program. Um, first of all, the Sense 101 coaching program, which is a life coaching program, but I'm also what is called a biblical entrepreneur, which is uh, moving me more into the business space. Um, because being the CEO of Mirema School, which is a family business, I have a very clear mandate, which is to build Mirema School into a profitable, sustainable and scalable business that will have a profound kingdom impact for over 100 years. Now, in the talk that has um, just concluded um, from Mr. Ohaga, I had a call to action for all mediators to start thinking about mediation, maybe more as a business. And this is a, a trap many of us fall in. Um, we are a school, a family business um, that has been in existence for over 20 years, but we fell into the trap of perhaps not taking it as seriously as a business and looking at it more as a helping kind of um, business. And I think as mediators, you, you might fall into the same trap as well, where I would say, please heed that call to action and start to professionalize um, what you do, because what you do is very, very important. And once you start to put business structures around it, some of the questions that I heard raised by Wangare about how to be taken seriously as a profession, how to make an impact might be assisted by having more of a business model to the way that you look at your role as mediators. So maybe thinking about how you can put yourselves out there on social media, how you can bring positive attention to yourselves, because then if people know who you are, they're able to take up the services that, um, are, that you offer, which are so crucial and critical. Um, I'll give you an example. Mirama School is one of the businesses that has a mediation clause in our contracts. And so that means that before anybody takes us to court, we have to go through a mediation process. But that we learned the hard way. We learned after several lawsuits, uh, mostly between employees and ourselves. And in, the, in my experience, when you go down the mediation route, you're more likely to get a positive result than trying to take things down the court route. So I think talk to us about the value of mediation as business people, because we don't know. We, some of us learned the hard way. So you know, put yourselves out there and tell us the value of mediation and how we can build it into our contracts and into what we do. So that was on a side note. I added this slide after listening to Mr. Ohaga. I thought it might be useful um, for you. 
So really what I'm here to talk to you about is um, start to give you some insights into the definition of special needs and the categories of special needs as they arise. And um, at the end, because I'm in the education space, there'll be a call to action for children who have special needs. And what I'll be um, endeavoring to do throughout the talk is to weave in your role as mediators um, and, and maybe just bring to your awareness some of the special needs that might be affecting how, how you deliver or how you uh, take up your role as mediators and maybe things for you to think about. We may not find all the solutions today, but I think the first thing is, you know, to become aware and then we can move to the next step or in terms of solutions and way forward. So looking at um, where the need for mediation comes in, it comes from conflict and conflict can be um, aggressive or it can be passive. And it just comes from how we look at scenarios. So one person looks at um, a situation one way and the other person sees it from a different perspective based on their life experiences, based on their own motives and sees the same thing differently. So conflict may not always be violent, but it can also be very disruptive and time consuming. So the role of you as mediators is to resolve disputes through mediation without having to go into the court system, which, um, which like I have said, we've had some experience of, and really that is the goal of mediation. Okay. Just having a technical challenge here. There we go. So um, ADR is something I've heard talked about um, this afternoon by Mr. Ohaga, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But basically, I was just trying to bring some context to this talk today um, on the role of negotiation, arbitration, and mediation. And looking then at the steps of you as uh, that you would normally take up as a mediator, which is start off with an introduction, tell the story, and then identify positions and underlying interests, moving into um, identification of solutions, revising those solutions and finding out if they work. And then finally, um, if the process is successful, reaching an agreement. And what I want us to do is, um, as we go through the different special needs that um, I'll be bringing to our attention this afternoon, it would be good if we come back to this again and think about how um, special needs would affect the effectiveness, the impact of this process, moving from introduction through to reaching of an agreement. So of course, the advantages of uh, mediation are clear. Um, it encourages open communication. And one of the things that I, I came to learn actually as I was preparing for this talk was that um, this open communication is also more confidential than if a case through, goes through the courts. So for somebody who doesn't want um, maybe uh, information to become public, then this is definitely something that is an advantage as op op opposed to having a case go through the courts. Um, it helps to maintain and improve re relationships, which is very critical. It's a small world and you don't want to have to, you know, cross the road every time you meet somebody that you've had a dispute with. So if you can agree on something amicably and improve that relationship, definitely that's a benefit. Um, clearly there's less of a financial drain, but also an emotional drain. Sometimes going through the courts is more emotionally exhausting even than it is financially. So uh, moving away from legal battles is an advantage. And then there's freedom to withdraw, seek legal counsel wherever possible. And um, I was impressed to see the success rates um, of mediation cases. So there are times when it's not suitable, when one party loses faith in the mediator's impartiality, however, both or whenever both parties are not committed to the process. So the process needs both people to be committed to it for it to work. And again, as we go through the impact of special needs, um, there are conditions that will make this very difficult. So um, that um, commitment might be affected in one way or the other, and we'll come back to that. And of course, you need participation and cooperation by both parties. And then when somebody's um, safety is at risk, obviously, that is going to be challenged. Um, how long does a process take? It's not clear. The answer to that question is not very clear. It's variable and it depends on a number of um, 
factors, the number and complexity of issues that have to be resolved, the speed at which new options can be generated, and the unique needs of the different parties that are at the table, um, on, at the mediation table. So maybe now we can get into the meat of, of the thing, talking about the impact of special needs on mediation. So the term special needs is generally used to describe a person with a physical or emotional difficulty or any difference that would require them to have additional assistance or consideration. And when people think of special needs, generally they think about disability, they think about, um, um, the, you know, just the, the um, deafness, blindness, those sorts of conditions. But actually we have found um, at Mirema School that um, special needs can be defined in different ways. So for example, if you have a child that has grown up in another country and transitions into Kenya and comes into the school, that child would never have studied, done social studies in school, they won't know Kiswahili, they won't know how we do things in Kenya. And immediately that is a child that needs some special attention. So based on that example, I would have been a special needs case for some time after relocating from the UK back to Kenya, because there were many things I did not understand. So when I walked into an M-Pesa shop and asked them to explain to me how this M-Pesa works, they looked at me like I was crazy. But in that moment, I had a did more assistance than the average Kenyan because most people know how M-Pesa works. So the terminology of special needs is something that has evolved through the years. Um, before there were words that are now not politically acceptable, such as mental retardation. Nowadays we talk about mental special needs, physical challenges, visual impairment, um, and those terms have, uh, have been um, generated to try and improve or reduce the stigma that goes with special needs. Um, there was a time when you would call somebody a retard. Um, it was actually a definition of the condition they have, but over the years, calling somebody a retard was an insult, and hence the terminology has evolved through the years. And we have to be careful to uh, make sure that we do not hinder people with disabilities because of their disability. At Mirama School, we call them differently abled because what you'll find is they have abilities, they're just perhaps different than the regular or average person. So not all disabilities are physical, a large number of them are actually um, invisible. And that is one of the biggest challenges um, for people with disabilities. So in my career, for example, I spent a lot of time looking after people who have multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis in the latter stages can obvious physical symptoms where you could end up in a wheelchair and people can see that there's something wrong with you. But actually the early onset of multiple sclerosis is invisible. So you have people suffering with, let's say, extreme fatigue so that they're not able to function or do the normal day-to-day -day things like, you know, tidy up the house, prepare a meal. Now for individuals like that, the challenge is that nobody can see their illness. So people are not accommodating, they're not willing to listen. Actually, they think they're using the illness as, a, as an excuse not to do what they, they, they're supposed to do. Another classic example with multiple sclerosis is sometimes it can affect your balance. So you find um, people with MS on a very hot day because it's affected by temperature, will start staggering around and um, they can't walk straight. And very often they're thought to be drunk. I can't tell you how many times I would receive a call from the police um, where one of my patients had actually been um, put in because they were staggering all over the place and it was thought that they were drunk to the point that we had to give them special ID cards that says, I'm not drunk, I have multiple sclerosis. And when they pulled that out, then that was managed differently. That's a Western example. It's not very typical that you'll see that in Kenya, um, but it's something that really should get us thinking because that um, uh, disability, sometimes when you see someone with a disability badge on their car and you look at them and they seem to be fine, your thought is this is not a genuine case. This is perhaps somebody pretending to have a disability so they can get special treatment. But what I am endeavoring to do here is perhaps you know remind us that not all disabilities are physical. Many of them are invisible. 
So let's move into the classification of special needs now. Um, the most common is physical um, disability, um, conditions such as um, cerebral palsy. Often you will see somebody who is either struggling to walk, they're using crutches, or they're in a wheelchair. Um, I've given an example from multiple sclerosis. There are conditions like uh, muscular dystrophy, which is a degenerative um, condition that affects the muscles of the body where the person's not able to move around. And it's a progressive disease. So over the years, it tends to get worse. We also have people who have chronic asthma. Now, when you think about special needs, don't think about conditions like asthma or high blood pressure or epilepsy. But these are, these, these are conditions when they're chronic can cause serious problems for that individual. So someone with chronic asthma is very limited in their ability to travel. The environment they're in, they have to be very careful because they can be triggered by small amounts of dust or whatever allergen it is that triggers their condition. The other condition that's often not well understood is epilepsy. So epilepsy is, some, is something that we, we relate to a seizure when the seizure is happening. So what you find is for many people who have epilepsy, because they have seizures from time to time, there's residual damage on their brain. So you'll find that over time, their ability to process information seems to slow down. Sometimes it takes a long time for them to understand what you've said. So they will understand it, but it will take them a while. It will take them a while to put their words together so that they can give you a response. And actually um, they can be misunderstood or thought to be slow or you know, not with it. And often it is the residual damage that happens to the brain every time they've had a seizure. So again, that is a physical classification of a special need. Um, another category is the developmental. These are the ones that happen in the womb before the child is born. So Down syndrome is uh, well known. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the more uh, well-known um, disabilities because you can see it very physically on the individual. And it comes up from a, a chromosomal issue, which is you know right from the point where the egg meets the sperm, there's a, a challenge there with the genetic composition and you end up with a child who has um, Down syndrome. These children often grow to adulthood and when they're well looked after, they're able to integrate into the society. Some of them are able to even have families and to live relatively normal lives. However, there are cases that are not so successful and that's not unusual. Um, We've got autism. I'll be talking a little bit more about autism and dyslexia because um, again, those are more common in society than we realize, but those are the classic undiagnosed dis disabilities. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move on. And then processing disorders. So th those are conditions that affect our ability to process information. So what it takes for me to be speaking in a way that you can understand is a lot of processing that needs to be happening in my brain. And for anybody who has even one element of that processing process not working properly, um, they'll have a challenge either understanding information or giving information to you. Now, moving on, we have the behavioral or emotional disorders. Um, we have attention deficit disorder. This one has become very well known in recent years um, with children being diagnosed with it, sometimes incorrectly, um, but where you have hyperactivity, somebody who can't settle down. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we have more of the, the mental health conditions, bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is where you have extremes of behavior. You have um, very eccentric behavior, very excited, very happy. And then the flip side of that is depressive moods. And it's called bipolar because the person goes between mania and depression. So that's the bipolar disorder. Oppositional defiance disorder is also another mental health condition, not very commonly diagnosed, but um, this is something that um, people may be living with and not know that they have. 
And then at the bottom, we have the sensory category. So the sensory are the ones that are most popular. So visually impaired, blind people, deaf people, um, people who have limited hearing. Very often people who are blind are not completely blind. They have some vision. So they have vision impairment. And that's the, the, the you know, in Kenya, that is the category that's catered for the most. In fact, in the education space, when you think about sitting an exam um, for KCPE or KCSE, there is allowance made for people who have these sensory disorders, but unfortunately there's very little allowance for people who have physical disorders. For example, somebody who has cerebral palsy, who has this constant shaking or movement in their hands or their body, which means that they're not able to write. So unfortunately, children like that cannot sit standard Kenyan exams and often they'll have to do um, to take up a different curriculum to be able to get through the educational milestones that they're supposed to meet. So on that note, we can move on. Um, Sarah, you let me know if we have questions in the chat, maybe at the end, because um, I've got quite a lot to say. I can talk endlessly. I don't want to be losing everybody as I'm talking. <laughs> no problem. I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So just to point out, physical and sensory disabilities are easier to spot. It's much easier to see them. If somebody comes into a mediation room in a wheelchair, you'll see that immediately and you'll know that there's something wrong. And then you might ask some questions around that about what you might need to accommodate this person. Um, somebody who has visual impairments, very often you can see it. Um, when you're looking at them, you can see either they're not looking at you when you're talking to them, or you might just see some physical abnormality with their eyes, which suggests to you that there's something amiss there. If somebody came into a room with, a, with an interpreter because they're deaf, again, you'll pick up on that straight away and you'll be able to have the discussion about what it is they need for that mediation to be successful. So much easier when you can see what the problem is. Now, there are conditions that are less visible, and this is where we start talking about um, um, some of them, like ADHD, which is Attention Deficit Disorder. Now, this is a condition that um, generally you'll notice it when a child is quite young, they are and they have difficulty paying attention, they have difficulty sticking to one task, um, and it's usually diagnosed as a child moves past the toddler years, and you notice that they're not even able to sit still for long. And that can move, you know, often children um, with this condition are branded as naughty children. Very often they will not be treated very well because it is thought that they're just misbehaving. They're not able to settle down. Um, but sometimes um, they, they go through life undiagnosed. And as adults, you'll find that they'll have problems paying attention. They get bored easily and they take time to complete any tasks that are given to them. Now, we all know people like that, and it's sometimes not very easy to differentiate between um, ADHD and just somebody who is difficult to handle on a day-to-day -day basis. But these are things that we need to think about because if this is a chronic problem, usually they will be branded, they will be labeled as to ni washida. Or, you know, one label or the other that is not helpful, which might be that it might be that this particular behavior is what landed them in the mediation situation they're in at the time you're meeting them. So that's something to think about if you notice it isn't normal, if they're very fidgety, if you look at their history and all you can hear is that that is what has plagued them all their life, then there's a possibility that there's a disorder that has not been um, uh, diagnosed or recognized formally in them. So in today's time, in this day and age, for younger children, there are treatments that are available for ADHD. Um, although some of them have um, some challenges associated with them uh, because sometimes they've been inappropriately diagnosed. Um, sorry, prescribed, inappropriately prescribed. But there are treatments that are available if the condition is properly diagnosed and um, they do help a lot with the symptoms. 
Okay, another one I'm going to talk about now is dyslexia. So dyslexia is um, quite common um, and it's a learning disorder that involves difficulty in reading, um, difficulty in identifying sounds. Um, it also causes, um, it, it's basically, it affects parts of the brain, the parts of the brain that process language. So with dyslexia, you find the individual is having difficulty reading. So if there is a document that needs to be read in the room, um, such people will struggle. So sometimes you have to pick out, is it um, a literacy issue that they don't know how to read and write? Or do they have difficulty reading and writing? And sometimes when people are not able to read and write, they, they're wrongly um, thought to be uneducated and exposed but actually when these children are found early enough um, we, we can actually help them and they, they do get over the challenges they have with dyslexia or rather we manage the symptoms better but now you've got somebody in a room where they have to read a document and try and figure out um, or, or you have to make a decision based on what is in front of you and the challenge then for this person is um, may, maybe very often they've been avoiding reading and writing because it's it's something that gives them a challenge. Um, they don't want to read aloud because they, they are concerned about um, embarrassment. Um, they'll mispronounce the words very often. And then another thing that lands people into trouble is people who are dyslexic sometimes cannot understand a joke or an expression. So when you say something like, um, uh, something was a piece of cake, meaning that it was easy, or something like letting the cat out of the bag, like, you know, telling a secret. Um, people with dyslexia may not be able to put that together. So very often they, they miss the joke and um, they're misunderstood in the community as either not having a sense of humor or being slow. And eventually they will, they'll sort of uh, pull away from everybody um, and, and just be less confident individuals. They also have difficulty summarizing a story. So in the mediation process where there's a story that needs to be told, they'll really struggle to tell the story of what happened to bring them to your, you know, to the mediation point. And they have difficulty memorizing even small things. Um, there's a version of dyslexia that even has challenges with sequencing. So sequencing from saying, let's say months of the year, January, February, March, April, they'll have a struggle with sequencing the months of the year. So they're not able to go through, let's say the calendar months of the year. So you can imagine the challenge someone like that will have in reciting a story in, with a timeline, trying to say back in this month of this year, and then moving the story forward to a different month of a different year, it would be a real challenge for somebody with dyslexia. But many people actually have this condition completely undiagnosed, so it, they, 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 they won't know that they have the challenge, and maybe the people around them don't either. So the history um, taking will be a challenge, and the summarizing of the story will be a challenge. Now, moving on to autism. Autism is um, a condition that affects um, the statistics in Kenya, one in 25 children. Um, it's becoming something that is we are more aware of. And um, basically autism is a spectrum disorder. So there's a wide range of conditions that are considered to be autism. And um, they start off from extreme ability. So we have some people who are almost, I, let me coin a phrase here, positively autistic, which means that they're able to do one specific task brilliantly. So they'll be outstanding in that area. Now, the challenge with autism is probably other areas are difficult for them to do. So I'll give you an example of a student we have at Mirema School right now. I will call him uh, Paul, for the sake of this um, conversation. So Paul is about, um, I think he's about 12 years old now, and he cannot speak in terms of conversational. He sings a lot of what he has heard. So he will have a song that he constantly hums and sings all the time. And when you meet him, you might think that he's not 
um, capable of much. But I can always tell if Paul has been in my office because, because he'll walk in, within seconds he will have changed my screensaver, he will have changed the settings on my laptop. It just takes a moment and he's been able to do so much on a laptop. He'll be able to have searched for the song that he wants at the, you know, he has trends, he has songs that he picks up on at specific times. And despite his inability to have a regular conversation, he's exceptional when it comes to ICT. And that isn't unusual. That is um, something that you'll see quite frequently in autism. But in the more severe forms of autism, um, you have quite a lot of disability. Um, you have somebody who's not able to take care of themselves and who needs a lot of care. But those are the two extreme ends. So you have everything in between. And one of the things with autism that makes communication and getting on with people are challenges. Very often autistic children um, don't know how to give or receive love in the way that is considered socially acceptable. So you'll find they have no expression on their face. Um, you can't tell whether they're happy or sad. Um, sometimes the sadness comes through crying or, you know, that tells you that there's something wrong. Uh, but generally, autis autism has that sort of blank expression, which makes it um, very difficult for them to get on with people in the society. So again, they can be misunderstood. They can be very rigid. Um, autistic individuals, even as, as adults, are very, very particular about the routine that they follow. So anything that is taking them away from that routine will not be well received. You will probably have noted on the media that the people who have really struggled the most perhaps in the COVID-19 period are, are people with autistic children because these children are used to a specific routine and the change that came from those kids not going to school was a real challenge. Now, when you, you know, translate that into an autistic adult, it's not very different. They may have learned some coping mechanisms, but anything that changes the routine is always a challenge. So typically you'll find um, they have a lack of eye contact. So when you're talking to an adult, they might not look at you at all. Now that could also be misunderstood because there might be a cultural element of that communication where people from a specific culture have been trained not to make eye contact, um, especially with you know, somebody in authority. Now, the other thing you'll find about people with autism is they will have, um, repetitious behavior. So they will do something, very often it's rocking, something like this, where they just continually rock. They might still communicate, you know, and, and give you all the right answers, but you find whatever it is they're doing, whether they're fiddling with a pen or fiddling with their fingers, it is continuous and repetitious. That's often a sign of, you know, some level of autism, but then not not just that symptom on its own, that particular behavior associated with other behaviors. So I mentioned that um, social touch and physical contact is usually not welcomed um, by an autistic person. And sometimes when you touch them, they physically draw away quite aggressively and that can be misunderstood. Inappropriate behavior is not unusual. Um, you know, laughing and without any particular reason is a challenge. Um, they may have an underdeveloped sense of danger. So again, they might be involved in activity that puts them at risk or puts others at risk. And they don't really have a sense of understanding why everybody is so concerned about that behavior for them. They don't really think about that. You know, their sense of danger is underdeveloped. And then of course there's, um, difficulty with communication, as I mentioned earlier, and very often autistic children have reduced sensitivity to pain. So it's not unusual that um, they get hurt and they don't notice or they don't cry out or they don't, you know, tell you that something has happened. And the same thing translates into autistic adults. So very often they're the ones who are at risk of um, um, actually death from, you know, doing very dangerous things. Okay, so having covered that, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, invisible disabilities in general, because um, we've talked, you know, about the mental, the physical, the different categories. So these are some statistics, they're mostly American statistics, but um, I think they still give a context. The challenge we have in Africa is um, we often don't have very good data on 
on different um, conditions and the statistics in Kenya in particular, perhaps because um, of, our, of our system, the way we track information. Um, we also have a lot of remote parts in Kenya and Africa, so we don't always get very accurate statistics. So, you know, we will bear that in mind as we go through this. So 10% um, of the population um, will have a medical condition that could be considered an, an invisible disability. Now, when we talk about invisible disabilities, let's also not forget things like, um, so right at the bottom of the list here, you can see gastrointestinal disorders. So people who may have irritable bowel, who may need to go to the toilet all the time um, in, a, in a situation where um, you've got a meeting going on and somebody needs to walk out of the room every 10 minutes. That could either be a nervous behavior, but it also could be that they have a condition that causes them to go to the toilet all the time. They might be unwilling to come to a mediation table because for them to even leave the house, they have to map out all the toilets between their home and where you're going to meet. This is not something people will often talk about, but again, it's a very, very real challenge. 96% of people with chronic medical conditions live um, with that condition. Um, no, I don't think that's very clear. 96% of people with chronic medical conditions live with it in its invisible space. So people don't talk about it and we'll touch on the stigma element of it, on it, or stigma element of it shortly. And then we have um, a group that is limited, um, activity is limited for them because of the condition that they live with. I think I've given quite a few examples as we've been going through that. So bearing in mind, we've got the psychiatric disabilities, we've got the chronic conditions, um, we've got the organic mental conditions, which again can also be treated, but often go undiagnosed. We've got the intellectual disabilities and the gastrointestinal. So ultimately for, for, for us in the society and for you as mediators, uh, one thing we must be careful not to do is to, to, to diminish people's abilities because of their, to, to diminish people's abilities because of their disabilities or inabilities. So I've put this slide up so that we can always bear in mind that we have people who have done great things in society regardless of, of the challenges that they've faced. So let's always bear in mind that we, we are not in the category of people that is saying that you can't do it because you have this um, disability or inability. Disability is not inability. It just means that we have different kinds of abilities. And and often, like I've stressed before, um, these, these children or these individuals will have um, areas of strength that are exceptional to them compared to the rest of the society. So um, here we've got some statistics from the 2019 um, census where um, it looked at mobility challenges, it looked at visual challenges, cognition challenges. So cognition challenges would be anything that affects your ability to be present, to respond appropriately, to, res um, to answer a question. So that's generally cognition. And then hearing, self-care and communication. So again, as you can see, the census basically picked up on the more visible elements of challenge or disability, and these are the statistics. So the largest um, category is the mobile, the, the physical or ability, the, the challenges that uh, reduce one's ability to get around physically. So I'm not surprised that one came up tops because that's the one that would be most obvious to the community, um, as we've said. And then this is looking again at um, a comparison between men and women. So here you can see um, um, that the indicating that 1.9% of men have disability compared to 2.5% of women. So women have more of a challenge. Um, and also looking at adults and children above the age of five years, we found 3.7% of men and 3.9% of women had a disability. For me, these, these statistics are extremely low when you compare them with the global statistics. And what I would like to stress is that there are more disabilities out there. It's just very likely that we don't know about them. They're undiagnosed and they continue to affect people negatively. So moving now to the stigma side of things, I always um, 
look at this image and, and it's, it's very telling because for anybody who has any kind of disability, it's not unusual that there's been a lot of negativity thrown at them, whether it is because of their behavior or their inability to act normally like everybody else. So when that happens, you'll find these individuals are not likely to seek out treatment or solutions. So very often you'll find anybody with, um, you know, um, a disability might take a very long time before they go to hospital and seek treatment, which is a negative thing because by the time they get there, perhaps the condition has, has gone on for far longer than it needs to. They also experience um, social rejection. They, they are often isolated. Um, their well-being, um, st um, st their wellness basically is at a lower level than everybody else. They're misunderstood. Sometimes they're even bullied. Sometimes they're physically violated for one reason or the other. And their quality of life is generally lower than that of the average population. So typically, if you have somebody who is living, for example, with bipolar disorder, this is a case I dealt with um, where there was a lady who, when she was depressed, would stay at home, um, never leave the house, um, um, and basically was not able to even fend for herself. And then when she was in the manic stage, she would go out, she would dress, dress very seductively. She would sleep around with almost anybody that she met. And that was something that was completely misunderstood in the community that she lived in because they just assumed she had, you know, um, how do I say this? Um, her behavior was, was, you know, either she's a prostitute or something like that. Before it was understood that she had bipolar disorder, gotten a lot of STIs, sexually transmitted illnesses. And when she was put on medication for, for the condition for bipolar, she actually managed to keep a job. She was able to look after herself. She's actually now got two children. Now, the challenge for her is that every anytime she's in the manic state, she's likely to spend a lot of money. She'll go out, she'll buy clothes, she'll live very extravagantly. And for those who have come to know her now, they're able to help her regulate so that uh, um, you know, something is going on here, um, you need to go and see a doctor. And when she does, she's given her, her treatment and over time she settles down and stabilizes. But the same is still true. She can go into very depressive states, which means that she won't get up. So, you know, with the people she has around her now, they're able to help her regulate this challenge. When I, you know, put myself in her shoes, if, if she didn't have that, she would not be able to have any quality of life. She would continue on this up and down um, roller coaster, which would be very detrimental for her in the, in the long run. And that's just one example. And, you know, you can imagine somebody living with a deformity, whether it's physical. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the stigma side of it as we go, because it's, it's very relevant. And it also changes that a person's ability to speak boldly, to be clear about what they want when they're at a mediation table. So when you're talking about a challenge and looking for solutions, if you're not your best self, or at least in good condition, you won't be able to you know, to put your points across, you won't be able to say what you want, you'll be coming to that table already less than the other person. So that's something to think about. Okay, so actually, we've come to that point where, you know, we, we were, I was saying that in the process of mediation, we have to think about the impact of special needs on each and every area. So telling the story, if I've got a challenge in actually following a timeline, I won't be very good at telling a story. If I'm not able to um, if you're, if you're not able to underline and to identify what my position is on an issue, again, that will affect your ability to mediate my case successfully. If I'm not able to give you alternative solutions, perhaps because I've got some autistic trait and I want things the way I want them and I don't want to move from there, that will affect my ability or, or your, uh, the ability of the case being resolved uh, positively. And then um, finally, that will just generally affect um, the, the, the point where an agreement is reached in the mediation process. 
So I just wanted to add this slide. I, I really enjoyed um, the session this morning um, from Derek Banga, where he was talking about in, um, emotional intelligence. And I just want to commend you as mediators. I think you do a great job. Um, biblically, you are blessed already. Matthew 5, 9 says that. And you know, for you to be able to uh, maintain the attributes of a good mediator, not only do you need big ears, do you need listening ears, do you need a clear vision to have your ego contained and your feet firmly on the ground, but hopefully after this process, you'll be able to you know, have a better understanding of the impact of special needs at a mediation table. So allow me um, to talk a little bit about Mirema School and what we do, because I think it's very relevant. Very often when I do these talks, there will usually be people after the talk who are asking me about um, their child or a child that they know that has a challenge. And so just allow me to go through this now. Um, talking about Mirama School. So at Mirama School, we believe that if you train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he will not depart from it. And um, we are a multi-curricular school, which means we have several schools currently all on one campus, but we envision we're going to probably need to grow beyond that campus as we move forward. So we have a daycare for zero to um, three years. We have a kindergarten for four to six year olds. And then at that point, the children can go into the local curriculum and into the international British curriculum. And then we have the special needs school. And very recently, because of COVID-19, we have a virtual school, which is an online school. Now, the way our special needs school works, there are different models of inclusion and integration. Now, the first model is obviously the least popular exclusion, where children with special needs are left out of the, the, the learning experience, they're not catered for, they're excluded. Now, the second model is the segregative model, where we have children with special needs being managed in schools, perhaps that are special needs school, segregate, segregated from other children. Now, I'm not going to disregard this model completely because there, there is a place for it, but really the majority of children can either be integrated or included. So what we have at Mirama School is a combination of integration and inclusion integrated, meaning that we have them in school with us, but they're managed in their own classes by their own teachers who are special needs teachers. They're trained in that particular area so that they can give the best experience to these children. But for a small percentage of children with special needs, we're also able to include them, meaning that perhaps for a, a specific subject, they'll be able to sit in a regular class with other children and maybe learn math with them. But that child might not be able to do the same thing across all subjects. So it might be like a, a, a mixed blend of inclusion and integration. So segregation works for children with very, very severe special needs where it's difficult to use the integrative and inclusive model, but the two models below are, are generally, you know, the ideal setup. Um, I always like to share the story of Ronnie Nyaga, who is currently 24 years old. Um, he's probably 25 by now. Um, Ronnie was one of the first children we had at Mirama School. So we had three children and he was um, a sibling of one other child. So he used to come to school with his sister, drop her off, and then um, go back home. And um, it, the, the, it was found that he just used to go home, pass the time every day, and not do very much until it was time to come and pick his sister up at school again. Uh, Ronnie had, has a mixture of challenges. He's autistic. Um, he has quite a mix. Actually, he's one of those children that will never quite be able to classify because one thing about special needs, you can't always categorize. Sometimes it's a mix. So to this day, he has no speech. Um, so when we took him in at Mirema School as the first um, child, children with special needs, he had been rejected by all other schools. So in those years, there were not many special needs schools available. And his mother felt that the special needs schools were not suitable for him because they had very extreme cases of special needs. So we integrated him at Mirema and he went through our curriculum and um, mom eventually relocated to South Africa and Ronnie is currently working independently in a factory where he's able to assist with packaging of small items. Now, because of Ronnie's autism, he's able to do that perfectly. 
So he's one of the, he's able to do the same thing in a repeated way. So what would be considered a symptom of autism actually is helping in him in, in his work life. He lives in a shared home. So his mother lives in another part of South Africa. So he lives in an assisted home. Um, and in South Africa, they have homes like that where they have uh, carers who live with uh, individuals with disability. They assist them and they're able to live and work and do whatever needs to be done. But regardless of that, Ronnie still has no speech. Now, he's a more extreme case, but the cases that you would have coming to mediation would be people like Ronnie who are functioning, who are able to work, but you know, Ronnie, if he's not well understood, would perhaps have more challenge um, from a community perspective than an average person. Um, so for us as Mirama School, at that point, after taking Ronnie in, we've taken in more than 500 other children. So 500 children have come through our doors, they've grown up or gone to other um, spaces, and we've faced some stigma even as a business for that. So for the child, obviously, we've talked about the stigma that a child would face, uh, mockery for the disability or handicap they have, isolation, and just people focusing on what they're able to do instead of what they are able to do. For the parent, and it's always good to think about this because if you are at a table with um, with somebody who has a child with special needs, they will have gone through certain things that change who they are. So very often people with um, children who have disabilities are blamed by the society. Um, sometimes they're, they're thought to that it's thought that the child that they have is a punishment for some sin or some curse that is upon them. There is an assumption that they neglect that child. That's why that child is not able to do what things other children are supposed to do. And then because these children need a lot of medical care and therapy, there's a big financial strain that is on them. And what we often say at Mirama School is sometimes the parents of uh, children with special needs perhaps not sometimes they have special needs themselves because even the way they see the world is different sometimes they feel like the world doesn't understand them there's no space for them and these are the challenges they go through so if they're at a table trying to have a mediation session with you they wouldn't be like a regular um, adult because they've gone through challenges that have changed who they are now for our teachers, um, this may not be so relevant to this forum, but I'll, I'll just mention it. For our teachers, when the children come in, sometimes we ha they have unrealistic expectations placed upon them by the parent or the institution um, about what they can achieve for this child. You know, people come in and say, make my child normal, which is often not possible. And then there's a lack of appreciation of the, the role that a teacher um, a special needs teacher takes on because it is a tough job um, and, and they're trained for it, but I think it, it really requires a special heart. And then for us as an institution, even taking on children with special needs, we face some stigma ourselves. So in the early years, and even now, there are parents who won't bring their children to our school because um, they don't want their child to be thought to be special. You know, people say, you're not special, even though we are using a blended approach. So that fear is very, is very much um, present. So um, I mentioned this, um, we continue with our integration and um, our inclusive approach. Currently for Mirama School, we have a mixed um, approach, one that is digital, even for children with special needs, we're able to, it's not always possible, but for some of them, they're able to continue learning um, digitally. Um, you can imagine many of them have health conditions, which makes it tricky for them to come back to school physically. And then we have the regular school where children come to school physically, which has just opened. So really, I wanted to stop there and maybe leave some time for questions, but I wanted to share one of my, my favorite phrases, which is from Maya Angelou, when you do the best you can until you know better, and when you know better, you do better. Because I think there is, there is this expectation that we're always supposed to be, you know, bringing our A game, doing the best we can. But as, as the years go by, we know more and more. And I'm hoping that from this talk, you know more and you might be able to deal with the situation differently. Um, in the first session,
heard someone ask Derek about how to go back and correct a situation perhaps where, well, my interpretation was it was, of it was that maybe somebody had not treated a junior very well and they wanted to go back and do better. And really, when you know better, you do better. So I really hope from this talk, we'll know better and we'll do better. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, Ms. Mutegi, thank you for that. Quite uh, deep, a lot of food for thought about how we have been practicing and uh, some of the things that uh, we need to think about. Yes. Uh, perhaps uh, just before we proceed, I would like to invite uh, Honorable Kendagor. Uh, Honorable Kendagor is the Mediation Deputy Registrar. I'll just uh, invite her to make some comments uh, kindly. Honorable Kendagor. Uh, Hello, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wasiliana Hub. It's, it's always really nice to join in the conversation. And uh, today I've, I've, I've been more of a student. I, I'm not sure I have uh, uh, a lot to contribute on, on the, uh, but just maybe to mention on the comments that this is really a very welcome uh, topic. Uh, it is not an area that we have uh, particularly uh, 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 comfortably report that we have paid attention to the needs of the clients that we have or uh, that we have uh, uh, perhaps even developed a policy or guideline uh, on how we can just improve the experience for them in, uh, in mediation. So to, um, to Nina, our facilitator, I think uh, I have picked in really, really lots. I already have a, a four-point action plan that I'm going to pick up on the issue of uh, special needs. And uh, this also just goes not just for the uh, parties that we have, but even our mediators who are uh, differently abled. So I, I really appreciate. Uh, thanks for jogging our minds and uh, the thoughts towards uh, it's improving the experience and ensuring that even when you talk about access to justice, it is not a, just a reassurance for those who are uh, able, but that we also give a consideration to those who are uh, differently able. Thank you, Atta, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Wasiliana, for the organization, and to you, uh, Madam Mutegi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Honorable Kendagor. And uh, yes, we are glad that you already have a few action points to be able to go and, uh, and follow through. Um, uh, Ms. Motegi, I do have uh, a few questions that uh, uh, I will read out. Uh, and of course, uh, some of the comments that have come in say that uh, you know the, the presentation was excellent and people have learned uh, uh, quite a bit. Okay. Uh, so, where uh, where can someone get assessment or how can someone be able to, uh, how can a mediator get help to be able to determine the kind of special needs that a person has? How can a mediator be able to get help to be able to determine the kind of special needs that someone has? And this is in relation to what you referred to as some of the less visible ones. So as opposed to someone who is uh, perhaps blind and you can easily see or they are uh, maybe deaf and you can you know, uh, somehow be able to, 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 to tell that they actually cannot hear. How, how does someone, how can someone, a mediator be able to tell that? Okay. Yeah. Um, do, did you have another one or shall I answer yes, that? Yes, I, I, I can uh, give you another one as well. Yes. Uh, what must the mediator uh, think about? What must the mediator think about when they are told that their clients have special needs? Uh, what must the mediator think about when they are told that their client has special needs? So perhaps you can take those two uh, okay. for a start. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That that's the question I knew was going to come, and it's one of the questions that's hardest to answer. Um, mm -hmm. where to get the assessment, where to get um, clarity on exactly what is going on with that individual. Now, because of the dynamic na nature of special needs, it means that they're, they're putting our children in classes is one of the hardest things for us to achieve because they are so different, they are so diverse, and that is exactly what you'll find in the adult population. So in terms of finding out what is going on with the person, 
maybe if you identify that there's something going on with them, then um, you can you can first of all start off with a psychologist um, or a psychiatrist. And what you find is very often there are practices that offer both services at the same time. So there are assessments that can be done by professionals to try and identify what's going on with this person and whether it's something clinical or whether, you know, it, 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 sometimes counseling is what is needed. Sometimes it's something clinical that needs treatment with medication or with specific therapies. So that's a starting point. Um, obviously there's a cost implication, which is why many people don't go that, down that route, but then the crux of it is actually many people haven't even identified that there's something wrong. So you'll find the family has been struggling and struggling um, without knowing that they're dealing with a special need. Um, for children, um, again, um, there are institutes like the Kenya Institute of Special Education that offers assessments. Uh, we offer assessments as well at Mirama School because we have um, a mix of professionals. We have the teachers, special needs teachers, we have occupational therapists and we have a tool that we use. Um, you could also approach an occupational therapist. They have tools that they can use to assess. So it depends on the age of the individual and I guess the situation that, um, that, that is ongoing. Um, I think that's the, 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 the response I would give to the first part of the question. The second part is talking more about how do I handle somebody if I've been told that they have a special need. Now, this depends on who has told you and what they've told you. So if they're a professional, they should do more than just tell you this special person has a special need. They should tell you how it affects them and the best way to handle specific scenarios. But if you've been told maybe by a family member, I've, I've had situations running the school where often it's between parents, partners, when they fall out, one comes and tells you, um, this lady has a problem, a mental health problem. And, you know, when you meet the other person, you don't think so because they seem quite clear about what's going on. So I would always be cautious about the source of the information that there's a special need. So, you know, um, base it on the source. And if the source is a valid source, then they should give you more information to guide you on the next steps. Okay. okay. Um um, th thank you for that. Uh, just uh, some more uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, how do you determine that you're actually making progress? Uh, so, for instance, if you're, uh, you know, having someone who is autistic, how do you know that you're actually making progress? And then uh, perhaps to go with that is, are there some uh, specific uh, special needs categories? that uh, you might say are perhaps uh, better suited not to be engaged at all in the process? Are there are some that you would say maybe for this particular kind of disability, it is better mm -hmm. that uh, you know, they don't engage in the process? Um, okay, so how do you know you're making progress? Let me resp respond to that first. I think the way you know is just the way you would know for a regular person. Um, trying to see whether from one session to the next, if the person has recall and is able to connect with the last agreement that was made, you know, because I believe with mediation, there's more than one session. So if you have a situation where the person can't seem to recall, um, they can't seem to be able to connect with what was agreed in the previous meeting, then you have to think twice because maybe there's a memory deficit, um, that, that brings a challenge. So maybe you need to look for somebody else to be part of the process or to think differently for that individual. Um, so, you know, I guess you would use the same, the same training that you use for regular individuals because actually, if you ask me, I think all of us have some, some level of special need somewhere. So I think you would use the same kind of intuition and training that you use for regular, you know, individuals. Um, but if it is an extreme case, so there isn't any one condition that I would say, no, don't engage with this, because even somebody with quite, you know, severe, maybe what, six, I'll use schizophrenia as an example, if they're well managed, they're able to continue the process. So it's all about how well managed they are in that period while you're going through the mediation. So what you'll find is for many people with special needs, there are 
exacerbations and then remission. So there will be a lot of that up and down kind of situation. But if they're well managed, if their condition is well managed, if they themselves are in a good space, you should be able to assess whether you can proceed or not based on you know, a session with them. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, then uh, how, what, what would be your advice uh, in terms of you know, handling uh, people with special needs uh, over the internet? So for example, right now, uh, with the COVID situation, then we have had to have, you know, the online uh, engagement, online mediation and things like that. Mm -hmm. What uh, things perhaps uh, do mediators need to think about if they have uh, special needs uh, people in, uh, uh, you know, online uh, mediation? Yeah. So that's a very good question. We had the same challenge in the education space where we went virtual as Mirama School and there was a category of our children with special needs that were not able to engage at all online. Real challenge, they had to have somebody next to them sort of to support them and to guide them. But I'm imagining that in a mediation space, what you have maybe is a challenge with problem solving. So for example, if there's like a technical problem with the connection, you know, solving a Zoom problem, they, they may not be able to get past a problem the way a regular person would. So again, you have to assess and see whether it's possible and, and to be creative and flexible in finding solutions. Because for our children, we had to initiate home visits for the first time at the school where we have a teacher going to the child's home in a structured way. So um, I think you can try it and look at what support systems are available for that individual. If they're not enough, then you have to think differently. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, I have a question from uh, one, one of the, the participants that uh, asks if, uh, she says your presentation is very good and asks if you have uh, uh, worked uh, with the government uh, and uh, says that you have a lot of data and uh, says that this is the mental health month. Uh, so what awareness is the school giving? So perhaps you could uh, talk to us a little bit about the mental health uh, month and some of the things that maybe you, we as mediators could uh, get involved in as well as, as, as part of uh, commemoration of the month? That's a very good question. I think after this period of COVID and schools and whether we are going back to school or not, I think I need some mental health support myself. It's been very, very challenging. Um, so I was aware it was Mental Health Month and we were going to put something on our social media platforms. But actually what we are currently doing is we are managing our staff and our children and our parents as the first priority because um, parents are confused. They don't know what to do. They don't know if it's safe to bring their children back. Some of them are out of work. So we've been running webinars for them um, in a very general way. I won't make it sound very personalized because that wouldn't be true. But at least we're trying to give them a space where they can air their opinions, we engage with them um, directly, and, and we move that way. With our kids, especially the ones we've had on the virtual program, it's been a bit easier because we do online mentorship. Uh, we have a program on Sunday. We're a Christian school, so we're very clear about our values. So we have a program that we've been running on a Sunday while churches have been closed, uh, where children can vent. And basically the content covered on Sundays is really to strengthen them, to give them strength, um, to try and move them away from some of the negative things that are going on in this period, um, um, you know, online and in the physical community. And then for our staff, that is something that is a work in progress that actually on Saturday, we've got a series of sessions that's um, going on for them to um, basically try and um, kind of strengthen their mental health as we reopen school. Some of them have fears about that. Some of them have chosen not to be teachers anymore from the teaching staff. So there's, there's a whole mix of um, emotion and uncertainty and people have responded differently. We've had a category that disappeared throughout COVID and you know we're looking for them to make sure they're okay where they are. But um, that's what we're doing with regard to mental health. And then we're going to have some um, counseling available for the staff as well. 
um, and lots of mentorship sessions for the kids because I can, we, we haven't physically opened yet, we're opening on Monday, but I know we're going to be receiving children who have been exposed to perhaps much more than they should be exposed to. So we're aware of that and we have some planning going on for what we're going to do to manage what, what comes up, which we don't doubt will come up. Mm. Okay. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, maybe what you need to tell us is uh, how can we as mediators, you know, get involved? And, and perhaps that draws back to, uh, you know, Mr. Ohaga's session and uh, you were in for his session where yes. he said that mediators need to, you know, to step out there and reach out. Yes. So, you know, which, which are the platforms or which are the areas that we mediators need to uh, make ourselves known that you know we are available and uh, we can be able to bring support, and and uh, perhaps you know as as you take us through that, you know, telling us which platforms we need to engage in, you can also give us some examples of some of the disputes that uh, I know you mentioned some in the in the in the talk, yeah. but uh, you know some of other areas, any other areas which you see as uh, as. Uh, like we said, and you said as well in the beginning that this is a business. So where are the opportunities for us as mediators? I think the opportunities are everywhere. If you look, the opportunities are everywhere. As long as you have different groups of people with different motivations, there's going to be the need for mediators. So my take would be look around you and see, because for example, if you approached Mirama School and you said you wanted to be involved, we often will have, especially in this period, there'll be a lot of um, family breakdown. Um, we have children that we send to counselors so that they can have family therapy. But very often, we don't even need to get to that point. Maybe you know, mediation between two parents who are not getting on um, would make all the difference before it even goes to court. Because I've seen how messy it can be when, when a case um, like that on custody of a child goes to court. And the child is the one who suffers every time every time the child suffers far more than anybody else their children we even encourage the parents to just let them come into our boarding school because what is going on at home is detrimental to the child so i would say schools um, definitely need mediation there's also the room for mediation between the, the the different stakeholders in the school so the parents in the school we've seen cases on social media where um, schools parents are taking schools to court because of one thing or the other we've recently started whatsapp groups for our for our parents um, in at class level and we've never had that before and actually sometimes it works very well but sometimes there's evident it's evident that there needs to be some better communication so that people know how to channel their grievances without necessarily you know it's like breaking an egg with a hammer sometimes um it's a bit excessive. So I think there's room for that. I think even a school would welcome somebody who is impartial. Um, just to, to stand in the gap, we have something similar. Actually, we've got a support group for uh, parents with special needs. And we have a psychologist that sits in to kind of mediate between the parents' expectations and what we can manage as a school. Um, she's chosen because she understands the world of special needs, but a, a mediator, basically somebody with that kind of mindset of conflict resolution would be very welcome in any school. So it's about packaging it in a way, and this is where the business angle comes in, you know, looking at what does a school need, what does a church need, what does a, you know, a block of flats need, you know, any environment where you have a community, what package can you put together to, to, to create a business model to make it a sustainable, viable um, venture? Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, perhaps I throw this uh, uh, to my fellow mediators just to ask if any of them has handled a uh, matter uh, where the, there was uh, either one party or both parties with uh, a special needs. Uh, any of the mediators, you can be able to post on the chat if you have handled that. Uh, 
when handling, uh, Ms. Mutegi, when handling perhaps divorce mediation, what uh, are some of the things that a mediator needs to think about uh, uh, if, if the child uh, of, of, of the couple has special needs? What are some of the things that the mediator should prioritize? Um, that's a really good question and an easy one as well. The, the priority is the child. Who is best placed to look after this child? Um, children with special needs. But the, the most agreeable version, I would say, would be a shared version. So what you'll find is most families who have children with special needs um, are single parent families. So unfortunately, in most cases, the man leaves. You know, what you'll often hear my parents say to me is, niliambiwa kwetu akuna watoto kama hawa. So the man will leave and um, the woman is often left with this child. Now she's under incredible strain because financially she may be struggling. Um, and in cases like that, what we try to do is we, we try and see if we can at least get some communication going with the father to see whether he'll at least support the child and even pay school fees. Because the other real challenge is rest for this mother. Children with special needs are exhausting. I mean, you, reg, children are generally full of energy, but children with special needs. I don't know whether you saw a media clip that was going around during COVID of a child walking on a balcony on the outer edge of a balcony in a block of flats. That was actually one of our kids. And um, the nanny was just at her wit's end and she's like, wake up balcony. She didn't think he would walk, jump over the balcony and walk on the outer ledge of the balcony. So in a situation like that, the, the initial response from the society was who is this negligent parent? But we know that child, he is not easy. He is not easy. So I also understood the mistake that the nanny made to put him outside. And she thought she was putting him in a safe space because the balcony was looking safe, but she didn't predict that he would do something like that. So um, anything that allows for rest and respite would be the ideal situation so that no one parent is, you know, taking on this child all the time. So support is very, very key for children with special needs so that one parent has a break when the other one's looking after the child. Um, but it's the most stable person. And then of course the finances are critical because there's a lot of therapy to be paid for, occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, and, and a lot of medical conditions that often go with special needs. Um, yes. Thank you for thank you for that, uh, Ms. Motegi. Mm -hmm. um, supposing you are a mediator, <laughs> I would be blessed if I was a mediator. <laughs> yes. Supposing you were a mediator, just yes. you know what 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 are some of the things that uh, you would. Uh, perhaps do different or prioritize or focus on? It, it, that's very general, Sarah. In, in what way? Um, what would I do differently? What would I prioritize? Okay, maybe if I was a mediator with what I know now, mm -hmm. I would maybe include a little bit of assessment before a mediation session to understand, you know, like, I don't know whether this is something you do as mediators, but to ask people, do you have anything we need to know about? Do you have any underlying conditions? Do you have, do you take any medication? before the session begins because sometimes that can give you give you some some hints and that's me speaking now more from my medical background because sometimes if you look at medications you can kind of gauge what condition this person might be living with that might affect the mediation um maybe that that should be my response um, yeah. it, it is it is a good one because I, i'm not sure any of the mediators has has thought about you know having that kind of uh, information prior to uh, to the mediation, uh, just you know commencing the mediation process. Okay. Um, so uh, I think in in general, there's been very good feedback uh, from uh, from the participants. They have learned a lot. I think it's very interesting. Uh, 
uh, you know, all, all that we have been able to pick. And, and as, just as we sort of draw to a close, eh? yeah. uh, so, some of the final uh, comments and, and questions. Eh? Yes. Uh, this uh, perhaps uh, you, you, we had asked if, is there someone who, uh, because of their special needs, uh, cannot participate in, in, in the process? But again, asking in another way is, is there any, any one particular, would you say there is a point where because of the nature of the special needs, then absolutely no form of dispute resolution would work? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm thinking of maybe more severe cases of ADHD. If you, mm. you have somebody who can't sit at a table physically, to, to discuss an issue, if you have somebody who um, is not able to tell you their opinion for one reason or the other, they're not able to articulate that um, for whatever reason, then I think those would be deal breakers, definitely. Um, if you have somebody who is paranoid, there are conditions that um, um, cause an individual to become very paranoid. And often that's even the reason that you're in that mediation because they have a very paranoid view of life. Then if that paranoia is there, then there's no trust of the mediator and the process. So I would say that would also be a deal breaker. So there are situations like that, but I, I, I'm of the opinion that, um, especially with our experiences of conflict at the school and just my experience, Starting with mediation is definitely the way to go because I think sometimes people just want to be listened to and want to be heard. Not sometimes, I think every time people want to be heard. It's an innate human need. And if that need is met, I think the majority of the time a solution can be found. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. And uh, something else, uh, Ms. Motege. Yes. Uh, Sometimes mediators, you know, work uh, with with the parents. Uh, you you know, working through uh, agreements about custody and maintenance. Yes. Uh, could you perhaps just give us an indication of, you know, some rough estimate of costs that you know would be required, you know, perhaps like for physical therapy uh, for a child, so that you know the mediator has you know some awareness of the range of what you know what would would work and it, it could be different costs for different conditions yes. so just, yeah just yeah share with us that as well so that is very very varied so i'll give you a couple of scenarios so let's use occupational therapy because that's something we offer at the school so for us at Mirema, we're able to have a, an occupational therapist on site. So whenever we have um, therapy, we bill it at about a thousand shillings per session, which is highly, highly, highly subsidized. If you go to a hospital like Gertrude's hospital, you know, a reputable hospital, a therapy session there, it depends on whether you're paying using insurance or not, but it can go up to about 4,000 shillings. And then usually you'll find a range in between 2,000, 2,500 from individual practitioners. So maybe qualified OTs who are running their side businesses. So they'll charge around 2,000, 2,500. And then there are um, organizations that offer therapy even for free. So you'll find they're linked to faith-based organizations where they, they, you know, people know that if you go here, you can get therapy. Sometimes it's for free. Sometimes it's very little money. Um, the challenge there is, of course, then those services are oversubscribed. There are too many people there waiting. And then you have to consider the cost of taking your child there, the time that it, you have to take off work. So those are the challenges for parents, which is why we chose to give in-house service so that if a child is in school, they can have therapy while they're in school, it saves some time and some energy and, you know, cost for the parent. So anything from a thousand to four thousand, sometimes more, uh, depending, but not much more than that. Uh, uh, would you give us uh, any other example uh, apart from, you know, the, 
Um, so I would be a little bit hesitant to talk about the rest because, you know, I, I, I even with your tea, I'm putting a disclaimer there. That's based on Nina's experience. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, so physiotherapy must will probably cost round about the same. Speech and language therapy is significantly more. Sometimes it can go up to six, seven, eight thousand per session for a child that needs speech therapy. Um, what some parents actually do is they, they use online solutions and then subscribe to someone in another country where it's cheaper. Um, because up until the other day, we didn't have many speech and language therapists in Kenya, but now we've, we're getting more coming through the, the, the education system. So that hopefully is getting cheaper, but it can range literally from 2,000 to 10,000, depending on where you go for, fees, for speech therapy. And then, of course, there are different therapies um, um, that are available apart from those. So those I can't really comment with any credibility on them. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and perhaps for the sessions to be effective, the child would need to have uh, a couple of sessions a week. Um, depends on the need of the child. Sometimes you can have a session maybe even once a month. Some need more regular care. Depends on the physical need for the child. For some children, they don't look like they need it, but they need some assistance with coordination, with gripping a spoon so that they can feed themselves. Um, so sometimes it won't be very apparent that the child needs therapy or the frequency that they need. But the best models are where the, the family is also trained so that they can continue to support the child at home not just when they're having the therapy so that's usually the better model um, and then if a child has had maybe surgery or some recent medical event they might need more frequent intervention um, thank you very much um, so ladies and gentlemen uh, we are at uh, the sunset uh, evening uh, session uh, this evening session we have been taken through by our guest uh, speaker, Ms. Nina uh, Mutegi, who is the director and uh, CEO of Nirema School and a Bible entrepreneur. Uh, she has been taking us through the topic able differently and making mediation and dispute resolution accessible to persons with disabilities and special needs. Uh, I will now invite uh, uh, Wangare uh, Kabiru, who is the convener, to be able to give some comments. Uh, Wangare, Karibu. Um, Wangare, please unmute. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Nina, for spending this time with us. And I am sure mediators have experienced uh, when I was speaking and you could not hear me. So what the experience really actually then would be when now you have someone who speaks in a way that you're the practitioner and uh, you cannot decipher, you know, what they're saying, or uh, you are uh, invite, calling them to invite them. The court has assigned you somebody um, uh, as a disputant. You're making calls because that's how you reach out and the person uh, is not able to speak or they can only be able to read or um, just one of the, uh, yes, the special needs that uh, God has uh, given um, and to us as human beings. Also, I'm delighted that we've been able to go through the invisible uh, or the not so obvious Um, the needs that, um, that, that are there. For those particular ones, I know we have been crucified, we have crucified uh, people. You know, sometimes when you reflect on your journey in life, whether it's in school or uh, even in the workplaces, as have um, come about for um, colleagues. And uh, I really, really would like to thank you for, um, for that part of the discussion. So that said, uh, uh, colleagues, the reason why we um, uh, did put together this particular session is because uh, for Wasiliana Hub, we are uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the back supporting you to, uh, in the development of your practice. And we are clear that there are uh, various uh, areas that uh, we can be able to have very specialized practice. 
And uh, when we say very specialized practice, we actually can have mediators who have mastery uh, in, in areas that have to do with either supporting families that have uh, personal special needs, or yet again, one of the things that I actually even um, uh, say that is uh, quite strong is that we ourselves as the practitioners, we have the special needs. And so in our practices, how are we able to establish practices that can be able to serve beyond um, ourselves, they can be able to serve others, and at the same time be of greater value. We see this as a, a niche, and just the same like you have a special education in school given um, a very, a very um, its, its own um, uh, prioritization and also consideration. It is of great concern to us in terms of, I mean, entities that are within the justice system, whether it's our court, entities like, for example, uh, companies, and they have a mediation that is uh, for a staff member. So how is that, is, is the special needs being accommodated? So we see it in those uh, three ways. One, with regards to being able to provide services for persons who have the special needs. Two, we as the practitioners also have special needs. So how are we able to develop our practices? And then also number three, how are we able to uh, approach or, in, or, or call institutions that are supposed to be serving the nation or institutions that are serving uh, uh, the public to be more sensitive and to be able to be accommodated for uh, special needs. So we, we see because it comes with us when we are sitting down and reimagining, you know, how can mediation serve the nation? Uh, when you look at uh, how to retool, so what do we need as practitioners? What, I mean, what additional information or what additional skills? One of the great outcomes of this particular session is there is need for a special needs assessment. And it could be a, a couple of questions, you know, when you make the phone call, it could be a form that um, is completed when you're having the intake. If you're receiving a, a, a matter from the judiciary, is, could there be some additional information that comes from the, um, the mediation clerk so that you know what you're dealing with? Because the commitment is that as mediators that we have greater successes in mediation, but we can already see the uh, complications that arise where, for example, you have either the, the, the person in dispute has a special need or one of them or both of them, or even you as a practitioner, you may have a special need that may uh, in, on face value uh, be deemed to hamper um, the, the, the particular mediation. So we look at uh, this as a great opportunity to start a conversation which uh, Madame Nina Mutegi, we have limited information even around the area of mediation and special needs, not only in Kenya, even across the globe. And yet mediation is a practice that is growing um, if, um, uh, internationally and also um, locally. So that means that there's an, an area where this is an area that we can actually be uh, explore further and be able to develop the learning and also the knowledge and insights and also as uh, mediators uh, do build capacity so that they can be able to serve um, disputants much better. So Madame Nina, thank you very much uh, for uh, the conversation with yourself. Uh, it has been a great delight. Um, I know you're still in school. Yes. Yeah, we, uh, we, um, uh, we could hear your, your, your people. <laughs> we could hear your people. Um, you could in, hear in them, yes. And, yes. Yes, yes, we're waiting for now for them to come and now play with your computer. <laughs> yeah, and, My dear. And, 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 yeah, and, and, I think, and I think really also um, it's quite interesting, you know, when you make an introduction with yourself of how uh, this medic has, is, has transitioned into now the, the business side and really uh, it speaks uh, from the, you know, being a biblical entrepreneur and being able yeah. to understand yeah, the kingdom. Uh, principles because yes they, if, uh, as a kingdom uh, uh, practitioner then you're here to you know dominate take over with all the principles and also the tools that make yes. business work so we commend you encourage you as you step on uh, yeah, the next level for the next 100 years um, <laughs> of Mirema school and yes as you uh, carry on in the mission so thank you for that uh, yes so colleagues today we have had the quarter three um, October 2020 mediation symposium day we started off at 7 a.m. Uh, on the discussion on emotional intelligence. Then, and uh, we were with uh, Mr. Derek Banga, who's uh, uh, the uh, tra tra who trains and also is the founder of um, um, of uh, Public Image. 
Then now uh, we had a break for uh, being able to do homework and school work and also some uh, work uh, in the day. And we met again at 2 p.m. And during the 2 p.m. session, we were discussing on the uh, the economics of dispute in Kenya. And uh, we had uh, Mr. John Ohaga, who is uh, 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 of People OK Law and also serves as a director at uh, the NCIA and is also part of the judiciary court. Now we are closing off with uh, Madam Mina Mutegi, who is the chief executive officer of uh, Mirema Schools, and our discussion has been on able differently, enabling mediators to serve uh, persons with special needs or have greater consideration for them. I wish to thank uh, Honorable Caroline Kendagor for gracing this particular session. And really, just as we said in uh, uh, the outcomes for this uh, for this session that mediation in Kenya will be transformed. It starts here and now and with you. So thank you, have a good evening and God bless you. Back to you, Mediator Sarah. Thank you for the time, God bless. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, convener. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining our session. Uh, since morning, we believe and trust that uh, you have been able to gain a very useful insight for your life and for improving your practice. Uh, uh, Ms. Mutegi, we are very grateful for your time. Uh, the challenge and the insight, now we will be able to, you know, draw up those uh, assessment questions, which we will share with, uh, you know, the parties uh, before we proceed. Uh, the, the presentations will all be available on the Wasiliana Hub uh, platforms. Uh, uh, the, the recordings will all be available, so you will all be able to have access uh, to them. Uh, I have been the moderator uh, for this particular session, uh, mediator Sarah Atter, and uh, we shall close uh, together with the, the words of the national anthem uh, recited in Kiswahili. E mungu nguvu yetu ilete baraka kwetu haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukai na unjuku amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mutegi. We appreciate your insight. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being with us today, the 15th day of October 2020, as we have gone through the quarter three symposium.